My name's Michael Wesley. I'm the Director of Academic Programs, Research and Outreach here at the ANU National Security College. And it gives me great pleasure uh, to uh, inaugurate this event, this public uh, lecture, in partnership with the Centre for Applied Philosophy and Public Ethics at Charles Sturt University. Uh, this lecture comes about as an opportunity, one of our distinguished international speakers uh, at a joint workshop uh, conference that we've just held on the ethics of cybersecurity. Uh, and it was this workshop that allowed us to bring our speaker tonight, Professor George R. Lucas, Jr. Uh, and we're very grateful to him for coming and giving us a public lecture tonight. Before I uh, go any further, let me acknowledge uh, the uh, traditional peoples on whose land we meet uh, this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Professor George R. Lucas, Jr. is a professor of ethics and public policy at uh, the Graduate School of Business and Public Policy at the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California. He has a PhD from Northwestern University and a Bachelor of Science from the College of William and Mary. His, uh, his particular teaching and research interests are obviously cybersecurity military ethics and, uh, and business ethics. He has a, a long and distinguished career. I'm not going to take up time uh, by reading it out. He has uh, a, a vast number of awards and publications. He is a senior fellow as well at the Stockdale Center for Ethical Leadership at the US Naval Academy. And he is on the executive committee of the Consortium for Emerging Technologies, uh, Military Operations and National Security. Uh, Professor Lucas is going to speak for about 45 minutes tonight uh, on navigation, aviation, and cyberation, and, uh, and then we'll follow with uh, about another 45 minutes of question and answer. Uh, the question and answer session will be uh, chaired by Suzanne Uriaki. Uriak? Uriak. Uniak, sorry. Shannon, you've got terrible writing. <laughs> <laughs> you fail. Uh, from, uh, from the Centre for Applied Philosophy and Public Ethics. So, ladies and gentlemen, without uh, further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Lucas. Thank you, everybody. Uh, it's great to be here and great to see so many of you tonight. And I suspect that there are as many as there are for a lecture that uh, so it has a rather boring or technical sounding uh, topic because you're no doubt confused and think that I'm that other guy, uh, the filmmaker. Um, so people came suspecting they'd see the real George Lucas instead of a virtual avatar. Um, uh, I'm used to that. Um, he's actually probably a distant relative of mine. The Lucas clan came over to, the, to Canada and the States from, from Ireland and migrated west. And his father ended up farming in California. And now I end up out there too. So I say in terms of family resemblance, well, let me see. He got the talent, the brains, and all the money. And I was left with his looks. Uh, well, uh, with that, I, I, I have to confess that, that I'm a little nonplussed uh, about this topic that we're going to take up tonight. Um, I was working on this, thinking about it, and uh, in the midst of trying to figure out what I'd want to say to you, I, I just became confounded, owing in part to the uncertainty about the levels of interest you'd have, uh, or the knowledge and background. I suspect there are people here who know vastly more about the cyber domain than I do or ever will. Uh, and there may be others who know very little about it. And for everybody, the idea of talking about ethics in connection with a domain in which there is very little of that, that there is sort of an unconstrained, uh, lawless environment, little in the way of law, rules, regulations, let alone morality, and no desire to have any. Uh, so, so why would we even address ethics in the same uh, topic uh, or you know, category as, uh, as, as cyber war? But even more, 
the problem I was facing was all of this. Uh, Snowden, I'm sure you've been following these, these uh, uh, revelations. And also, I put uh, Private Bradley Manning from the United States Army up there because I think there's going to be a tie-in with both these young men and their attitudes about what their government is doing and what they felt morally compelled to do about it. And I, I don't want to shirk that. I, I want to acknowledge it and talk about it. But it was very unsettling to have all this going on at the very time you're trying to you know, compose your thoughts and, and work on this talk. I sat down a couple of days before we left to think about it again. And I turned on my cable box to get some nice, peaceful classical music. And instead, I was treated to Guardian reporter Glenn Greenwald and a New York Times columnist, whose name I can't remember, and a conservative lawyer, all yelling at each other in a debate on the Piers Morgan show. Uh, about the, level, the, the latest revelations concerning X key score, uh, which is one of the new revelations about programming that the National Security Agency in the United States was using to track everybody's uh, email and, uh, and so forth. Well, I noticed that not only was there a tremendous difference of opinion in what they were saying to each other, screaming at each other actually about this, but also equivocation in their understandings about things like privacy, the severity of threats to security that was posed by the Snowden leaks, the proper role of whistleblowers in bringing all this, prompting uh, public attention to something that needs to be discussed more clearly, and in general about the kind of damage that the National Security Agency or its critics were doing or could do. For example, despite assurances to the contrary, the NSA can't really neatly distinguish between the transmissions that come across the wire from foreign nationals and US citizens. Uh, and so that's troubling enough in itself. And then when uh, Senator, US Senator Dianne Feinstein pointed out, well, it's all all right, because we're not really listening in to any US citizens. Uh, we're only listening to foreign nationals transmissions. I thought to myself, well, thank you. That's going to really make a positive impression on whatever friends we have left uh, to know that we're not spying on ourselves, but only on them. Uh, my wife, who's here this evening, is also a professor, teaches military ethics, business ethics at the Naval Postgraduate School. And she's, uh, her specialty in philosophy is ancient philosophy, uh, particularly Aristotle. So I asked her, Patricia, how would you feel, you know, searching for a little sympathy, how would you feel if you were asked to give a lecture on some of the main features of Aristotle's metaphysics, talking about being, purpose, causation, motion, whatever it might be. Suddenly, the newspapers and TV are full of sensational charges and attacks that Aristotle slept with his wife and betrayed his lovers. He stole antiquities from Egypt. He opened live chicken eggs without government or institutional review board approval. Um, that's very disconcerting, how all that sort of thing going on in the background where you're you know, trying to figure out what I'm what I'm going to say to you. Well, actually, one of the things I want to say tonight is that I think, surprisingly, Aristotle, believe it or not, has a lot to offer to this discussion. Now, it's not, I say that not because my wife would thrash me if I didn't, or not because he knew anything about cyber conflict, but because he developed what I think is still the best methodology, or rather gave the clearest description of what reasonably intelligent, normal, thoughtful, reflective people should do whenever they're confronted with mass confusion and uncertainty regarding a topic. Maybe that topic is how best to live or how to organize their political life or what to do to resolve that uncertainty and hit upon a course of action. Well, we'll get to that method. That's part of what I want to talk to you about tonight. But first, let's talk about this confusion, this, um, this whirl of uh, um, controversy about the internet, about security, and uh, the cyber domain. The cyber domain, at first glance, is a rather strange place. The objects that reside there, the events that occur in this domain, seem utterly unlike anything in the normal physical world. If you place a normal phone call, for example, from here in Canberra to your brother in Sydney, the call most likely travels as a fairly conventional electromagnetic transmission for a few hundred kilometers over a trunk line, a large wire or cable, or now likely a piece of fiber optic cable. It stretches along a physical route between the, the two cities. If you decide to email your brother instead, that's, uh, that message is going to get broken down into discrete packets that may take all sorts of different individual routes around the world, possibly several times. Uh, interestingly, by an accident of history, 
all of them probably will pass at one time or another through the United States. Um, all of it at the speed of light, and then they're finally reassembled at your destination. Well, likewise, if you get a call, phone call from your brother, you probably can determine or verify his identity right away by the sound of his voice. You may not know if a, you know, a, a criminal has a gun to his head and is making him call you or something, but you can pretty much tell it's him and not some imposter. If you get an email from him, well, that may be fraudulent, seeming to come from him from all outward appearances, but actually it's part of a, a spear phishing campaign in order to get you to click on open the email so that the real sender in, I don't know, Uzbekistan can insert malware on your computer that will steal your credentials, your identity, or your credit card number to be sold to criminal gangs in Russia and the Ukraine. Various internet vendors and providers may offer to protect you from some unscrupulous plots like this by offering to sell you antivirus and firewall protection, and also offering to store your vital data and software, not on your own computer, laptop, or even notebook where it can be attacked in this way, but instead, I love this phrase, in the cloud. <laughs> Conjuring up some transcendent non-material realm in which the capacity for storage is infinite and the ownership and security of each precious item is guaranteed. Now, I have to tell you that I'm a curmudgeon, <laughs> and uh, I'm not a technophobe at all, uh, but when I heard the, the original you know, advertisements about cloud computing, I was sort of grumbling, well, come on, it can't be nowhere. It has to be somewhere, and until I know exactly where it is and who has it, I'm not giving it away. I'm keeping it on my own hard drive. And then I fried the hard drive, and so I was ushered into the into the cloud computing whether I wanted to go there or not. But quite astonishingly, many people believe this sort of non-material illusion propagated by internet vendors and service providers until a, until a few environmental investigators began discovering the sudden appearance of enormous windowless warehouses cropping up in the uninhabited countryside near major cities, each consuming nearly as much electricity as the city near which they resided they gradually realized that these were, after all, the physical servers, the banks of computers and memory that Amazon, Google, and Microsoft were using to store your data, and their energy use, their heat output, because, of course, the memory banks had to be cooled, overall carbon footprint made them vastly less efficient and more environmentally destructive than if you had just gone on storing your data and programs on your hard drive. Well, in many other respects, the cyber domain presents a number of challenges resulting from its historical evolution and from the seemingly unique objects and events that exist or occupy the space or transpire, if you will, within that domain. Unbridled freedom of action and anonymity, or at least the illusion of anonymity, are values associated with personal privacy that constitute the portfolio of individual rights enjoyed by the denizens of this domain. At the same time, anonymity, freedom, and the difficulties of attribution offer the possibility, in principle at least, of individuals, organizations, and even nations doing unrestricted and indiscriminate harm to one another without any discernible accountability. What Chinese army strategists uh, over a decade ago called unrestricted warfare. So that's our domain. Recent worldwide acts of cybercrime, theft, vandalism, sex trafficking, and money laundering, like the, the recent case of the criminal internet bank, Liberty Federal, all of that stands side to side with relentless and ongoing commercial and military espionage and theft of industrial and state <laughs> secrets, all of which threaten the security and welfare of individuals and nations. Yet efforts to counter those activities and provide greater individual and state security are strongly opposed in many rights-respecting and reasonably democratic societies as constituting an unacceptable infringement on liberty and privacy. Cyber pundits like Richard Clark um, suggest that this impasse, this inability to do anything about this area, is just going to go on until something drastic happens, until there's some kind of cyber Armageddon or Pearl Harbor or whatever of a magnitude similar to the kinds of things like Pearl Harbor, the real Pearl Harbor, or the terrorist attacks of 9-11. Now, let's see if I can get that. I think some of those claims that we see in books like his Cyber War in 2010 can be a bit exaggerated. That, uh, 
If you've, if you've read some of these works, you know that they talk about planes falling from the sky, chlorine gas escaping from nearby chemical factories and, and killing thousands of people in the nearby cities, trains running off the rails, dams bursting, uh, floodwaters ensuing, and so forth and so on. That's the kind of description of the Armageddon that he gives. Well, I think actually, technically, it's kind of unlikely that three members of an Al-Qaeda cell hiding out in a flat in Hamburg, um, or that your neighbor's 14-year-old son, like this fellow here, uh, hunched over his computer in the upstairs bedroom. I don't think it's likely by themselves they're going to be able to cause planes to fall from the sky or destroy dams and power grids and cause massive floods, accidents, and widespread loss of life. It's not because they're incompetent. It's not because they couldn't, in principle, do these things. It's because, really, this scenario that we see here painted, uh, this, this, this exaggerated threat, reflects our lack of knowledge about the structure of cyber weapons themselves, about the kind of weapons that would be required to do some of these most dramatic things, like exploding a hydroelectric generator and destroying a dam. To do that kind of thing, you need to be more than very clever, unscrupulous, and an alienated computer geek. You need access, for example, to a hydroelectric generator to practice on. And last time I checked, it's kind of hard to wrestle one of those things up three flights of stairs in Hamburg and into the apartment, and they don't fit into the geek's upstairs bedroom. You've got to practice on them. You've got to know how they work. It takes a long time to play with them and develop the programming to control them and fool the people who are operating them. And that's expertise and time and resources that most of us, including you know, the 14-year-old neighbor, just don't have. Remember that that neighbor's geeky son, much like Edward Snowden himself, was very smart, but not really a very good student. While the geek was surfing Facebook and hacking into Pentagon computers at home, he forgot to do his physics homework. And he flunked that course, so he hasn't the slightest idea how a hydroelectric generator works, let alone how to destroy it. OK, so I think sometimes we get carried away with these scenarios, and we ought to just kind of rein in and, and you know, take a deep breath and, and realize where realistically we stand. And the good news in all of that is that it takes enormous resources, expertise, and time to build effective cyber weapons with genuine destructive capacity. And those resources are probably accessible only to pretty well organized and determined nation states. Now, that may be scant comfort, but nations unlike deeply alienated and troubled 14-year-olds, or in Snowden and Bradley Manning's cases, 29-year-olds, they have a pretty clear-cut set of interests to which we can appeal. We can talk. We can cut a deal. We can come to a compromise. Now, I don't know how many of you have seen um, Mark Bowden's book, Worm. Um, that's another one of these recent doomsday scenarios. Um, but there, uh, they're this worm that is described as resident on your computer and virtually every computer in the world. Uh, and nobody knows what it's going to do or what it means. Uh, the, the worm is called Conficker. And uh, now I think as a result of Snowden's revelations, we can take some comfort in saying, well, come on, that's just another project of the National Security Agency in the United States. They planted it there. It's a uh, it's a, 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 a resident worm that will take control of everybody's computer, turn it into a zombie, and create this massive uh, uh, worldwide um, botnet that will shut down any kind of real threat to the internet. Or, of course, it might destroy us all. But then you'll have the comfort of knowing, well, it was our friends in the United States who did it. It wasn't the Chinese. So, um, Actually, Conficker, for those of you who speak German, uh, you're probably trying to keep from laughing out loud, it, it's sort of a German slang curse word. And while decorum presents, uh, prevents me from translating it literally for you now, you can probably look at it and sound it out and figure out what it says and what it means. And that would be right. And it would be a pretty good description of what most of us, after we've studied the, the, the internet problem for a while, uh, it's a good description of, of the human situation, according to, uh, at least according to existentialist philosophers. We are all configured. <laughs> Nonetheless, um, the need for enhanced cybersecurity, especially for the protection of individuals and individual infrastructure, is an urgent and still unmet need. Prior to Snowden going viral, 
I had planned when I came down here to make the case that some of the public resistance might be overcome by distinguishing more carefully between individual liberty and privacy as defensible rights and anonymity of the sort enjoyed and practiced by Liberty Reserve Bank, for example, in its $6 billion criminal money laundering scandal. Anonymity is not a right. It's not at all identical to privacy. And it offers primarily freedom from accountability and detection. And it's the latter, not the former, um, that is compromised by stronger cybersecurity measures. So I want to talk at the conclusion of my presentation this evening, a little bit more about that distinction between privacy and anonymity and between the way and, uh, and about the way in which cybersecurity enhancement would compromise anonymity without necessarily compromising privacy. But first, let me get back, as I promised, to saying something about Aristotle. How do we, in the face of all this uncertainty, with regard to cyberspace and cyber domain. How do we handle it? How especially do we handle the uncertainty attached to novel developments, new technologies, contrasting or competing ways of living? How do we grow comfortable with the new and the novel? How in particular do we discern the appropriate rules or principles of the game when we don't even know what the game is, let alone what the rules are? It was the Scottish and American uh, philosopher Alistair McIntyre who some decades ago pointed out that we do have some clues about how to sort things out when we're confused like this. There is a procedure illustrated in several works by Aristotle on ethics and political theory. And the procedure itself is described in great detail in one of his great logical treatises, The Posterior Analytics. Basically, the method is this. When we don't know what's going on or what the rules are, Let's start by gathering all the relevant data we can about the practices in question, moral customs in different cultures, various kinds of constitutions and political arrangements in Aristotle's case, or in our case, various activities and practices taking shape in the cyber domain right before our eyes as we watch. We begin intuitively based upon their operational effectiveness to discern better from worse practices. We ask, in essence, the question that the American popular television psychologist, Dr. Phil, asks. So you're operating in a lawless domain, and you're all stealing from one another and tweeting your junk. and whatever. How's that all working out for you? Uh, so you ask yourself questions like this, and you begin to say some of it's working out pretty well, or we can live with it, and some of it isn't working out very well at all. We discern better from worse practices. We also draw comparisons between what we know and what we are confronting. And the things that we are familiar with that seem to resemble them. We engage in reflection, dialectic, argument, even quarreling, if that's a generous description, I guess, of what was going on on the Piers Morgan show with uh, uh, the, the three reporters and the lawyer arguing. We extrapolate from the known to the unknown and gradually then begin to build out of all of that what Aristotle called the archai, the first principles that govern our practice from our varied experiences of and reactions to the variant forms of practices themselves. In the talk that I was privileged to deliver at the opening of this uh, CAPI seminar that we had uh, um, during the last couple of days on Monday morning, I likened this to the conception in international law and international relations of what folks in those fields call emergent norms. <coughs> The evolution of law when confronted with new and novel developments is a really good case in point for how this works. The complex relationship between law and morality is one that's always intrigued me, but it doesn't really need to throw us off right now. Just don't worry about what that relationship is. Remember that instead, we always tease both law and morality for being way behind things like this. We're always behind the power curve, we say, in the engineering schools. Uh, on uh, the laws and pr moral principles that ought to govern technology. And we're playing catch up. And that's certainly true of the cyber domain. Lawyers, both criminal and international, have really made strides in substantive contributions during the past decade. The folks in ethics have only just in the last couple of years started to get involved. That's what is so significant about what Suzanne Unicate and her colleagues have done here, uh, Adam and, uh, um, and Shannon and, uh, um, and Nick, in putting together this wonderful conference that we've had over the past two days. So the lawyers are working. 
great deal of body of law has been developed. The philosophers, the, law, the ethicists are kind of trailing behind on this, but getting on to the bandwagon. But if Aristotle's right, that's not a flaw. That's the way this works. That's how it goes. It's exactly what should be expected. Legal scholars, in particular, work by analogy and from past experience in the form of precedent. But in order to cite precedent and draw analogies, they need a new body of experiences to work with. So confronted with emerging examples of the new and the unknown, they then turn to precedent to help classify and categorize the new behavior and reason by analogy and extrapolation from past practice to present governing principles. That's the legal scholar's answer to the old question. How shall we worship the Lord in a strange land? We don't have a temple. We have to worship in the temple. Ah, but we have the Torah. Uh, and we know what to do with that. We know how to sing psalms and chant prayers. And uh, anyway, my Uncle Morty's got a terrific place. He's in with the king of Babylon, and he's got a big living room. Let's go over there. And besides, Moses didn't have a temple. We'll figure this out. You know, we'll get there. So that's kind of how the law works. We don't have a great deal of experience with cyber conflict, although our familiarity is increasing daily in accord with something called Moore's Law, named after the co-founder of, uh, of Intel, the chip-making industry giant, Gordon Moore. Moore's Law says the pace of technological change doubles every 18 to 24 months. That's why I felt so overwhelmed trying to figure out what the heck I'm going to say to you when the two or three days between the time I'd finish the talk, get on the plane, and fly down here, everything would have changed. Um, it, it, it's, it's frustrating, but we can pause and notice that we have now arguably had some experiences, including what I would claim are four instances of cyber conflicts that could not properly be classified as criminal acts or even acts of espionage and covert action. And on those, we can focus and find out <laughs> something about better and worse ways of behaving in the cyber realm. Professor Thomas Ridd at King's College has objected that none of the four instances I want to cite for you tonight were acts of war, but that all could be classified as either crime or sabotage. But of course, acts of sabotage are acts of war under international law. And a lot of these actions cross the boundaries between ongoing low-level conflict like espionage and covert action and might rise to the level of what we might call a genuine resort to force or the equivalent of an armed attack by one nation against another. Well, that's all we've got to work with. And I've spent a good deal of my own time the last couple of years discussing and analyzing what lessons we might learn from these cases. Otherwise, I think Professor Ridd is basically correct that virtually all cyber conflict has boiled down to more or less straightforward crime or acts of espionage. There's some discussion that we're still not clear on now whether infusing a nation's civic infrastructure, power grids, water, food, so forth, uh, logistical supply chains, with backdoor booby traps, crosses that line between espionage and covert action, which are always illegal within the domestic framework in which they're carried out, and might instead arguably constitute the equivalent of a use of armed force. So there's still stuff we're not kind of clear on yet, but we keep staring at this. It looks as though, by and large, crime is what has seemed most familiar for all the novel new ways of carrying it out. Um, of these types of malicious activities that we might consider in cyberspace, crime's the one that we've been most confident and effective in classifying and beginning, at least, to respond to uh, in its new threats, in new forms of threats and challenges, even as the extent of criminal ingenuity and enterprise is vastly magnified by the internet. Dr. Pano Yannicka Jordis is here. Uh, he's a colleague uh, from the Air Force Research Institute. He gave one of the uh, keynote addresses at the CAPI conference uh, on Tuesday morning. Uh, and I was privileged a couple of years ago to uh, join him for a conference that he sponsored in his own institution on these topics. And there, a civilian cyber expert working with the FBI and international Interpol agents rounded up, managed to round up a huge ring of Russian-based cyber thieves using precisely the te techniques that we now, thanks to Mr. Snowden, know of as PRISM and X Keyscore. That is, the cops studied Facebook transmissions of the thieves and from the patterns and publicly accessible content of their postings and their transmissions, they were able to track them down and arrest them. 
And I was there, as I say, at the conference, and I asked the presenter, uh, I said, did Mark Zuckerberg, you know, is he on board with this? And the answer from the civilian cyber expert was that he didn't think Zuckerberg would want this successful sting to be generally known, but that the technique that he said was classified was indeed highly effective. Now we know what it was. It was PRISM and X keystroke and all these other things that law enforcement officials were using to fight crime on the internet. Did they violate the Russian criminals' right to privacy in doing so? Did the criminals even have such rights? Under what legal regime? Were bad precedents set or unacceptable practices tolerated for the sake of the justified ends we saw it, namely putting a stop to their thieving and catching them and bringing them to justice? So we have the usual mess to clean up and clear up once we're on to the nature of the problem. As I say, however, the basic nature of the criminal activity is actually quite familiar and common and generic. Suddenly, we feel as if we've seen all this in some form before, especially when all is said and done, that characteristic theft of other people's money. Um, you know, the internet has become the place where the, that American bank robber, I think his name was Willie Loman, said, why do you rob banks? You know, because that's where the money is. Well, now the internet is where the money is. And so even if some of these old cons take on new forms on the internet, we can recognize them for what they are, figure out how to prevent them, combat them, apprehend the criminals, while striving ourselves to remain respectful of individual rights, liberties, and the boundaries of law. That's the age-old dilemma of constabulary um, duties and forces, police forces everywhere. How do we rein in the criminals without behaving like them? How do we rein in the criminals without destroying the rights and privileges that they threaten ourselves? Okay, so I think in crime, we're doing a pretty good job. How about war? Well, the first ethicist to look at cyber, mostly as I noted, the international lawyers were the ones who were doing the first scrub. I think too quickly, in my opinion, they concluded that there were too many dissimilarities between cyber and other domains, airspace, uh, land, um, to be very useful. And we couldn't make any useful analogies or use any of our previous knowledge to address and resolve these new conundrums. Well, knowing what I just described to you about law and the evolution of law and Aristotle's method, I just didn't believe it. I didn't buy it. It's not that there was never anything new under the sun. It's rather that when looked at under the sun, the new things tend more and more to resemble things that are familiar to us and that we can work with. So let's look at what the various nations and people have recently been up to and how they reacted and what the rest of us, upon reflection, think of it all. Richard Clark gives good and juicy accounts of the four instances of cyber conflict that might qualify as acts of war. But if you're interested in these, there are reams of accounts of all four episodes now on the internet itself. Let me just review the highlights for you. Estonia in 2007, the government decides to move an unpopular Russian war memorial from the center of Tallinn to a military graveyard outside the city. Russian citizens and their government are outraged, as were citizens of Estonia of Russian descent. Subsequently, the government of Estonia reports that the country is under relentless attack from outside sources unknown. The attack is a cyber attack, a DDoS, a distributed denial of service, flooding every Estonian website with enormous volumes of traffic, effectively shutting them down. Newspapers, banks, government websites, financial and civic transactions, all these things are brought to a standstill. Hospitals, the medical system are attacked. In a highly wired, tech-savvy nation, commercial and government affairs grind to a halt. The government appeals to NATO to come to its aid under the collective security provisions of the NATO treaty, claiming that the attacks have originated in Russia. The government of the Russian Federation, however, denies any involvement or responsibility. We can't be blamed if individual patriots or hoodlums take matters into their own hands. NATO declines to become involved, stating that the massive cyber attacks do not rise to the level of armed conflict. So we ponder that and go to the next example. In September of 2007, the Israeli Air Force allegedly carries out a nighttime bombing raid in Diawa al sharir in Syria, destroying what was alleged to be a nuclear power and weapons facility that was under construction there, apparently with assistance from North Korea, that is, building the plant, not destroying it. The conventional night bombing raid appears to succeed, um, but that's because a prior cyber attack has disabled and spoofed the Soviet-era uh, 
air defense systems that Syria used, making the military appear to see clear skies and utterly miss the flight of the Israeli bombers into their airspace. The nuclear facility is destroyed. Six North Korean workers are killed in the attack. Likewise, in that same time period, Russia proceeds in early 2008, actually, to its conventional armed intervention in the breakaway province of Ossetia with a, dis a distributed denial of uh, service attacks that were designed to frustrate Georgian command and control systems and interfere with government communication and coordination uh, of response to the Russian invasion. These attacks appear to be aimed solely at government and military sites. Finally, if you've not been vacationing on another planet over the last couple of years, you know that a computer worm named, nicknamed Stuxnet by Microsoft security experts who later studied it, apparently took control of an array of nuclear centrifuges operated as part of its nuclear weapons program in Iran. Deceiving the Iranian operators, the worm gained control of the centrifuge array, causing individual machines to malfunction and self-destruct. It's several months before the attack is discovered or be, let alone begins to be understood. It's more than two years before analysis coupled with security leaks reveal that this particular computer worm was, after all, a cyber weapon allegedly created either by Israel, the US, or from a collaboration among both, all part of a larger operation of surveillance and attempted sabotage known now as Operation Olympic Games. Well, there are examples. What can we glean from them? Well, I've argued in my own work, earlier work on this topic, I think we can learn a great deal. First, the last three in that sequence appear to be part of a serious set of grave conflicts between sovereign states, the sorts of thing that lead to war. Some commentators, like, again, Professor Reed, Thomas Reed at King's College, don't think any of these instances are wars. I disagree. The last three are certainly acts of war or involved in war. And the last is unique in being an act of war, resulting in physical damage and destruction of a military target solely by the use of a cyber weapon. If you look at it in that continuum, then, that first one, that attack on Estonia, seems somehow out of proportion to the latter three. The justification for conflict is nearly non-existent. At most, it's a diplomatic matter. The attacks in that first case are directed indiscriminately at civilians and civilian infrastructure. It does not seem appropriate, quite apart from legality, to try to harm hospitals and patients and deny ordinary citizens access to their financial resources all over the dispute regarding a war memorial. Of course, the government of the territory from which the massive attacks originated denied any knowledge, involvement, or responsibility. That's the so-called attribution problem in cyber war. But the 2001 International Convention on Cybercrime commits nations to policing criminal activities carried out in cyberspace from within their borders. While the rulings of the United Nations Security Council authorizing the US-led intervention in the matter of the Taliban and Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan in late 2001, established for the first time that a government could now be held accountable for failing to attempt, even to attempt in good faith, to put a stop to or expel non-state actors involved in international criminal conspiracies arising within its borders. So a number of international lawyers have looked at those cases and said, in the case of a cyber conflict at least, NATO would have been justified in holding Russia to account for the attacks because it failed to do anything to stop them. Uh, and if it doesn't, then someone else could, or some action would be entitled uh, or would be justified to, to put a stop. Uh, but the nature of the harm inflicted and the damage done did not, in NATO's opinion, rise to the level of an armed attack, unlike the other three cases. So what we might wonder would have happened and what would we want to see happen, we could ask ourselves, if those attacks had persisted, gone on longer than four days, and the harm done become more than massive inconvenience, and instead resulted in widespread deaths, immiseration, loss of property, would NATO have then been justified in some kind of retaliation? Of what sort? Conventional or in-kind? Well, these questions are addressed in a recently published legal document from that set of international lawyers, the 2012 Tallinn document, as well as in a larger sense in the cyber strategy statements emerging from nations like the US. Our own cyber strategy, from the Department of Defense at least, seems to declare that should a nation like Russia or China 
try to pull in our country what they pulled in Estonia, they're likely to get a cruise missile down one of their smokestacks. Well, now there's an interesting norm. Uh, at the opposite extreme, the Israeli and US, uh, alleged US attacks on nuclear facilities under construction in violation of the UN Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty and against express orders to cease and desist from the International Atomic Energy Commission seem to constitute legitimate threats. And the attacks themselves in response are aimed purely at those military facilities or installations, not at civilians. The damage done in those cases seems proportional to the risk of harm threatened by the illegal uh, activities themselves, the nuclear uh, programs. I must say that similar conclusions can be drawn regarding the Russian cyber and conventional attacks upon Georgia. It's not a matter, after all, of playing political favorites. Georgia, after all, is a member of NATO, and we might you know, feel uh, you know, disposed to take their side in this. But the conflict between the two states seems a legitimate one. The aspirations and concerns of Ossetians and their complaints against the government of Georgia, at least, worthy of expression. And the intervention directed solely against military targets seems far more justified, as well as proportionate, to the harm threatened or inflicted uh, than it did seem in Estonia, where it seemed wholesale and indiscriminate. Clausewitz might chide us that, after all, in the Russian-Georgian case, this is what war is for. When we can't come to an agreement, we use force and force one side to do the will of the other. Uh, so we might ask ourselves, is the Russian Federation, as we look at this uh, sort of continuum, are they beginning to work out principles governing cyber attacks, justified cyber attacks? Are we? What would these begin to look like? Well, let's see if we can list them based on our discussions now of those cases. It looks like something like the following principles seem to be ones that we could probably all reasonably well agree to. First, cyber attacks, like conventional use of armed force, ought never to be deliberately directed against civilians or civilian objects or civilian infrastructure. Never deliberately. Cyber attacks may be and should be only directed at legitimate military targets with the twin aims of minimizing collateral damage or loss of life and inflicting overall only so much damage as is commensurate with the degree of threat represented by the target itself. That seemed to work especially in the case of Stuxnet. Some more things we might learn and conclude. A cyber attack can be deemed equivalent to the use of armed force whenever it inflicts harm or damage equivalent to what would be generated by a conventional attack. For example, it does not matter whether the Iranian centrifuges were destroyed by bombs from aircraft or by a cyber weapon. We call this the principle of equivalence or equivalent harm, but it entails another principle that when faced with the choice of means and methods of force to be directed against a justified military target, the weapon that is capable of neutralizing the target with the least threat of additional collateral damage, harm, loss, or life is to be preferred, required. How should we fill in the blank there? What would we like? That's where we need to focus our attention and try to resolve and maybe clarify exactly where we stand as we look at these cases and see we've actually learned a great deal. Of course, it leaves a lot unsettled. What is the threshold of cyber harm that would justify use of force and retaliation? Where and when and whether and how to retaliate against a serious cyber attack with a conventional attack, the cruise missile down the smokestack, rather than a proportionate cyber attack? And note in the last case, another troubling feature, Stuxnet, the use of force there was preemptive. Well, really, it was preventive. It was directed against a possible future threat rather than a clear and present danger. Does the advent of discriminate and relatively non-destructive cyber weapons lower the threshold against preventive war? Or do the same prohibitions apply as in the case of conventional force, where we generally think preventive war is not justified? But I still would argue we've accomplished a lot here. There's a lot there that nations, even adversaries, could agree upon and mutually uphold and enforce with some of the questions remaining to be addressed and considerably clarified. That's how emergent norms work. And I believe we need to recognize and build 
on the progress we've made. So now, having said that, I want to come back in conclusion to um, the question of privacy and anonymity. Since the most severe obstacles to moving ahead with this agenda have now become the revelations of Edward Snowden about US surveillance and espionage, perhaps it's time to return in conclusion to the intractable problem of privacy, the alleged infringement of which motivated Snowden to come forth and blow the whistle on PRISM and X keystroke. Nothing could more clearly indicate the importance of framing some new rules of the road for the cyber domain and various actors and activities taking place within it than the current public controversy ensuing in the wake of Snowden's revelations about the surveillance, the metadata mining, unprecedented data collection by the US, the UK, security intelligence organizations on phone conversations, email, internet traffic generated by their own citizens and citizens of other countries. Vice Admiral Mike McConnell, the former director of the US National Intelligence uh, Agency, apparently oversaw the development of PRISM and X Keystroke and obtained authorization to operationalize those programs at NSA while, surveying, or while serving in the presidential administration of George Bush. During that period, Admiral McConnell took a leading public role in warning about the dangers of a wholesale cyber attack, terrorism on or using the internet, the need for greater internet security. I worked for the US Navy and certainly heard Vice Admiral McConnell on these topics. I quoted him on occasion. I said, look, we've got to take this seriously. He and other NSA employees with whom I spoke over the past couple of years certainly led me to believe that there was more that our intelligence and security apparatus could be doing within the limits of law to provide for citizens security without undue invasions of their privacy. It's embarrassing to confess to spending many months myself writing an article on privacy and cybersecurity that argued that we should be doing what, as it now turns out, we were already doing <laughs> without public knowledge or consent. Meanwhile, Vice Admiral McConnell himself left the government, went to work as vice president of a private military contractor, Booz Allen Hamilton, where he argued strongly for the role of private security contractors in providing greater internet security. He got his wish, and Booz Allen subsequently hired Edward Snowden. Thanks a lot, Admiral McConnell. <laughs> Thanks a lot, sir. I feel like a complete idiot about this, and I hope he does as well. Could this all have been handled better? One nagging question we have is how, comparat how this comparatively young, inexperienced, and obviously rather troubled, alienated personality like Snowden or like US Army Private Bradley Manning, how could these kids have gotten such relatively unrestricted access to such enormous amounts of sensitive classified data? As the author, uh, uh, I think it's Mike Greenberg, points out in his new book, This Machine Kills Information, Manning was not, and now we know, neither was Snowden, a senior experienced career professional like Daniel Ellsberg. Ellsberg, who knowingly, after deep deliberation, sacrificed a distinguished and long career and risked going to jail for life in order to blow the whistle on what he genuinely believed to be a campaign of deliberate misinformation to the American public regarding the Vietnam War. Now, even though Ellsberg himself has praised Manning and now Snowden and come to their you know, aid and assistance in their defense, they were not like he. They probably should not have been placed in these kinds of positions, and they lacked the judgment and experience that Ellsberg brought to his own evaluation. And I think that's true even if you disagreed then with what Ellsberg decided to do in publishing the Pentagon Papers. And it's also true if even you now agree with what Snowden and Manning did do in releasing the information. The th thing is, they are not like, they are not like Ellsberg. As Greenberg notes, a kid with a bad attitude, possibly misguided libertarian tendencies, and a disaffection for his own group and organization or nation can now bring the entire world to its knees. And their culture, anonymous, WikiLeaks, our future Australian Senator um, uh, Julian Assange seemed determined to do just that in the name of transparency or in defense, oddly, of privacy, no matter who or what gets hurt in the process. There, I think, is the problem we conf that we confront. They see themselves, guys like this, um, and much of the international public sees them as whistleblowers. Whistleblowing itself is a practice that I would morally defend though not, in these specific cases, the indiscriminate violation of national security that they perpetrated. 
In both cases, I think what they revealed was in fact less shocking and damaging than they themselves thought. They were both young, not especially well educated as it turns out, not in technical subjects, but in philosophical reasoning, the product of a liberal education. Critical reasoning might have led both still to worry about the boundaries of unjustifiable practice, whether in war, as with Private Manning, or in surveillance, as with Mr. Snowden, but might have led both to blow the whistle in a manner which did not immediately compromise the lives, in Manning's case, of valuable, courageous US allies and operatives, or in Snowden's case, of specific practices, some of which just might have been proving effective in combating and preventing terrorist attacks upon innocent civilians. Consider that in Snowden's case, the American public elected officials who in turn and in their behalf authorized and oversaw these intelligence activities and saw to the appointment of judges to sit on classified what are called FISA courts, uh, the Federal Information and uh, Secure Intelligence and Security Act, to rule on the legality of their operations. One of the many things this public uproar has focused upon is whether those elected and appointed officials had lost some of their objectivity and impartial distance in the process, trusting too much, maybe approving of too much. On the other hand, remember that the first thing we, the public, do in the aftermath of a terrorist attack, whether it's Australian tourists killed in Bali or runners in the Boston Marathon, is where were the domestic and international security agencies? What were they doing? Why didn't they intercept and prevent this? It's madness to act like that and then suddenly get precious and protective of our privacy when they're discovering that they're doing, in effect, what we kind of asked them to do. I find that attitude bordering on unconscionable when citizens are, as the New York Times reported last month, willingly giving away information on or to Twitter and Facebook that we would never, upon consideration, be willing to volunteer to the government. I believe that we, the public, here in Australia, in the United States, in Europe, we suffer from the same uninformed, confused naivete about privacy and surveillance that at the beginning of my talk tonight I cited regarding the cloud. We're prone to be unthinking, unreflective, and unreasonable in the conflicting demands we make upon our public servants in this regard. I think, moreover, there's a lot of confusion over what is meant by privacy and what components of it need most protection from cyber snooping. Privacy is not the same thing as secrecy and anonymity. It is instead control over information pertaining to one's self. Voting, writing and mailing letters, even making phone calls or using the internet can be private matters, but they're neither necessarily secret and they certainly aren't anonymous. They take place largely within a public space, what even the Chinese now call a public space. Privacy might be like the curtains you hang on your windows. Everyone who cares to know, uh, um, anyone who cares knows you live there, but they ought not to be able to determine routinely whether or not you're home or precisely what you're doing. You're not anonymous when you vote. You have to register and go to a polling place and check in and authenticate your identity and registration uh, and confirm your right to cast a ballot. It's what you mark on the ballot that's private. Ditto with letter writing and posting. We know a lot about your activities if we care to inquire. We just don't know what is inside the envelope you posted. PRISM and X keystroke and data mining generally in the government sector are mostly like that. Namely, your internet behavior and communications are no longer anonymous. But we don't care to inspect their contents unless you are placed under suspicion and the security forces obtain a warrant to inquire. We don't necessarily afford the same rights and privileges, as uh, Senator Feinstein so helpfully pointed out, to non-US citizens. But there's no doggone way we couldn't do that, and we ought to try. Otherwise, as I've stated myself numerous times in print, um, I think that the confusion that we're facing here with regard to privacy, anonymity, and rules of the road in the cyber realm kind of resemble some historical experiences we've had in the past with new technologies like the automobile and the airplane at the dawn of the 20th century. People clung to their customs, clung to their individual rights and liberties, even as their behavior on the increasingly crowded and populated city roads, for example, constituted a threat to the lives and well-being of themselves and everybody else. It took some time to figure out what the proper rules of the road would be that would guarantee a maximum of privacy and liberty of action to individuals making their own choices and moving about in the conveyances they chose, 
and making their, you know, those choices with security and safety that would come from requiring things like speed limits, passing conventions, brakes, headlights, signals, and ultimately seat belts. Every one of these, and especially the seat belts, you remember, was thought to be an unwarranted, unacceptable intrusion upon privacy and personal liberty. But we've come to see that most of those regulations are promoting sensible public safety. A similar evolution took place about the same time and over the same period with the invention and proliferation of flying machines. Very quickly, the airwaves came to resemble the confusing amalgam of different entities and activities that populate the internet now. All different kinds and styles of aircraft owned and operated by all sorts of different people, commercial organizations, governments, and the military, all sharing the same airspace, moving around, getting each other's way, requiring some kind of regulatory common environment. The rules of the road for flying, in fact, were developed in deliberate analogy with the customs of very familiar marine navigation regarding things like lighting at night, right of way, crossing, passing, and followed by military, civilian, commercial, and private aircraft, just as they were with the sea craft, from pleasure boats to submarines on the ocean. The very term aviation itself was a neologism coined at the time precisely to call attention to these parallels with navigation and how those analogies were helping bring organization to what was then a new domain. Aviation is an even better analogy than driving, since the very realm of airspace had hitherto been largely inaccessible, and the machines and methods developed to move within it were much less comparable to anything familiar than were, say, horseless carriages to actual carriages or horseback riders and pedestrians. In both cases, we also needed substantial new infrastructure to handle the traffic. But still, we did as we've always done. We compare the known to the new. We extrapolate from the known to the unknown. We try out, modify, revise, bumble along, and forge ahead. That is what is underway in the cyber realm, as this debate, started now by Snowden, unintentionally reveals so clearly. In like manner, we might call our problem now cyberation, the need for rules of the road for all the different entities, activities, purposes, concerns that share the fifth domain of cyberspace. ISP security handshakes, metadata mining could come to be understood on analogy with the role of police and traffic security now keeping an eye on things, ensuring good order and discipline, but otherwise leaving people alone to do largely as they please within the limits of the law. It's a shame that this constructive public examination and deliberation had to await the onset of scandal and whistleblowing. That all could have been handled better. In the US case, for example, by having officials state clearly for the record, hey folks, we're doing everything within our power, within the limits of the law, to guarantee your security while respecting your privacy. privacy. Obviously, we can't say exactly what we are doing in those respects, lest those from whom we're trying to protect you get wind of it and alter their tactics or behavior. But you need to know that members of Congress with experience and security clearance are overseeing and authorizing the policies, while judges appointed by the Chief Justice of the United States are reviewing the legality of their actions. You should know this is going on. If you're worried about it, inquire about the procedural adequacies of this safeguard, and we'll do our best to be respectful. I think that's almost reasonable people needed to hear. And the unreasonable ones would have then had license to press those inquiries and air their concerns about the adequacy, thoroughness, and impartiality of the oversight and accountability, or, success, or suggest more integral procedures for selecting the judges. Whatever the case, the fat now is in the fire. We're left to make the best of the mess that's been created. But on analogy with the description of Aristotle's process I've described tonight, I'm sure together we'll figure out a way. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Professor. This is a very uh, interesting and stimulating talk. I'm sure there are lots of questions and comments. I think we have about uh, half an hour. So if you would like to make a comment or ask a question, can I ask you please to raise your hand now and I'll make an initial list and uh, come back to Okay, I'll start with the one that has one that's right on the back row with the red time. Um, in your ethics of cyber war, one of the issues you might need to consider is the law of unintended consequences. And we saw that with some of the recent malware where it escaped out of the environment in which the target was seen and appeared somewhere else, which is not something that we would want to see in such right. an event. And the other issue, which is that that 
product is then picked up and thrown back at us. Um, like the old days where you could throw a spear back at a right. person who had just thrown it at you. How do those ethics of the laws of unintended consequences apply with any consideration of cyber Thank you. That's an excellent uh, question, and uh, it's, uh, there, there, there are several um, features to the answer. Basically, the unintended consequences are what are called in military circles collateral damage. And you, yes, you have to anticipate that, plan for that, minimize that. In the case of Stuxnet, you'll recall that one of the interesting features of the program when it was discovered and it was analyzed by Symantec and other security organizations was they discovered that it would only operate in a harmful way if it encountered a particular numerical array of Siemens centrifuges operating in a certain fashion, of which there was only one example in the world. Um, and otherwise, it was dormant, even if it showed up on your computer. Still, it was there. It was troubling. It was not entitled to be there. It was violating your, uh, your, it was violating your personal property, your territory. Um, the worm had a code in it uh, that caused it to self-destruct on, I believe, July 12th of last year. So if you found it resident on your machine, presumably, I haven't verified this, but it shouldn't be there anymore. People like Pano, uh, my colleague from uh, Air Force Research Institute, know a lot more about this than I do. And the fact that that code was there, and if it worked, indicated that whoever built it, I actually thought this was kind of amusing, whoever built it thought about this very question. What happens if, despite all of our precautions, it escapes and gets out into the general world? One, we need to be sure it doesn't do any harm to anything or anyone else. Two, we need to get rid of it. So away it went, supposedly. Uh, that leaves, however, the um, reverse engineering threat that terrorists or uh, hacktivists or others could, in the meantime, get a hold of it, study it, and use it against us. Um, was that sufficiently thought through? Uh, my suspicion is that when you study cyber weapons, you recognize that they basically aren't like nuclear weapons sitting on a shelf where you could steal a few and carry them home, and, uh, uh, or, or hand grenades, or, or uh, R2Ps, or something like that. They're not, uh, they're not weapons of that sort. They're generally very uniquely designed to do a specific thing. Once they have done it, or they've been discovered, they're really of no use to anybody anymore. You can study them all you want, but you're not going to be able to replicate them and use them. Why? Because everybody's security will have been configured to find and stop anything that looks remotely like that. So uh, the cyber weapons experts say cyber weapons are all one-off. They get, you, you get to be used one time, and then they're useless. So the idea of reverse engineering I think is based on a mistaken analogy that the cyber weapon is a thing just like a, a nuclear weapon or a bomb or a hand grenade, and it's not. It's a very precise engineering thing that, uh, I mean, you'd be out of your mind if your cybersecurity software didn't uh, have in it now numerous kinds of uh, uh, firewalls to protect against uh, something that looked like Stuxnet, since we all know everybody who cares to is familiar with it and could build such a virus and, or create such a worm and try to use it. Uh, if that's right, then the collateral damage from inadvertent escape is probably, all told, pretty minimal. But that remains to be seen. Because we did see the fricking of Saudi Arabian oil computers shortly after that. Yes. Um, I would disagree that it's a one-off event. The capabilities and tools, especially within cyber uh, crime are being continually reused over and over again. And right. we are seeing an escalatory activity within that process. So I do think there still is a risk, no matter how much activity and effort is taken, that in the deployment of a cyber weapon, we actually risk increasing the capability of our adversaries and competitors. Point well taken. I think that remains to be seen, and, uh, and there are the, you know, what I have asserted is not certainly um, um, beyond reproach that they're one off. That is, uh, I'm not the expert in this. My colleagues who are say that that is the case. It's very hard to re you can reuse the weapons, but they'll only be effective against uh, systems that haven't been updated and protected against them. So it's not that they can't be used at all. And yes, if they could be used in any sense, uh, 
then you've enhanced the ability of malevolent activity or forces on the internet to uh, engage in malevolent activity. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Lucas. That was an extraordinarily articulate and well-balanced account of what I certainly have found uh, extremely difficult to get my head around. And I, I came out of a policing background, so I've been considering the significance of this for some time. And uh, looking at the whole spectrum of the cyber threat, going from cyber crime, and perhaps at the lower level, right up to cyber warfare, it seems to me that uh, far too much emphasis has been given on the extreme and not enough on the, on the quantitative threat, which still seems to me to rest with the cyber crime threat. And I think that, in part, is due to the fact that there is a big push also from, to use the old term, the military-industrial complex, who sees this as another really big money-making opportunity. And somehow, when you're entering into the ethics of the discussion, it seems to me that they also should be included in that balance to try and moderate these things a little bit. Um, the other, that was a comment. The other is a question. Um, clearly, the United States has been very badly hurt by Snowden's revelations, and clearly they want to get him back. And clearly they want to use him as an example for others who may be tempted to do the same, so I'd assume, presumably they'd put him before the courts and give him a very long uh, sentence. Also, this incident has led to a breakdown in what should have been a, a recasting of the relationship between Russia and the United States, which strategically is very important. And to some extent, you can see that Putin's right by saying, this is not important enough to unrail that, although perhaps it may work out that way. My question is, what would you think about the ethics of a swap between Snowden and Victor Boot? <laughs> Clearly, the Russians want Victor Boot back. Clearly, the Americans want Snowden. If the swap occurred, then clearly Victor Boot would become a hero of Russia and Snowden would become just the opposite in the United States. What do you Very think nice. about the ethics of that? I'm a little worried about, um, at, in the present climate of opinion, until we've kind of taken a deep breath and settled our um, collective public conscience and consciousness a bit more than we have on this matter in the States about getting our hands on Snowden. I think we have ended up treating private Manning very well, all things considered. Uh, and that, that gives me hope that we could do the same thing with Snowden. In both cases, both men broke the law. In the case of Private Manning, he was a uniformed officer who took an oath as well. Uh, so his behavior betrayed his organization. It threatened the lives of his colleagues and comrades. So I think it was a much more serious um, moral error on his part. Uh, and even so, I think people rightly, uh, the, the, the judge in the case showed forbearance and restraint in, in recognizing he didn't mean to aid the enemy, that he really did believe he needed to blow the whistle like Ellsberg did on, on what he thought were inappropriate American reactions. Uh, some have said had he only released the Apache helicopter tapes from 2007, and just let it go at that and said, there's a lot more I could raise, but I'm blowing the whistle on this and I think this is just unacceptable, that we could have tolerated that. He would not have broken a law or, or at least behaved in a way that would have generated serious criminal punishment. Can we reach the same conclusions with Snowden before we get our hands on him? <laughs> um, I, I think we cannot let this just go unpunished, but Again, I mentioned that Piers Morgan program uh, uh, where the, the um, um, Guardian reporter, New York Times reporter arguing, well, look, we're now having the discussion you all said we needed to have. The reason we're having it is because Snowden released the information, but you want to put him in jail. <laughs> What's the matter with you people? Well, I, I think that puts the finger on whistleblowing, the paradox of whistleblowing generally. The, the whistleblower knows, as Ellsberg believed, that he's going to go to jail. He will be punished because he's engaged in illegal activities, and he's willing to do that because he thinks the nature of what he's revealing is so important he should be willing to take a hit to get it out there. Um, there was no apparent recognition on the part of either Snowden or um, um, Bradley Manning, that they were actually going to get caught, uh, or that they should be, or that they should be willing, 
as the canons of whistleblowing generally suggest, be willing to you know, break the law and suffer punishment uh, for it in order to draw attention to your, your cause. So I think it's a little too soon to figure out how to get our hands on the guy through a swap. Instead, I think, to go back to your earlier point, sir, that, that uh, we should recognize that as serious and damaging as this has been, a lot of it was our fault. A lot of it was bad policy uh, that made us vulnerable to something like this, including our use of contracting, and private contractors are not part of the security organization to handle our, our work for us, uh, mitigate our and, and moderate our responses to Snowden and perhaps continue to talk with the Russians. They have just done what we would have done if the situation was reversed. Now, that's a private opinion. I have to issue the disclaimer. I do not speak for the Naval Postgraduate School, United States Navy, Office of Defense, uh, and probably I will. You'll, you'll, this is the last you'll see of me. <laughs> I'd like to suggest that uh, we're moving into an area where ethics need to develop into the 21st century, uh, somewhat differently to what we've had in the past, and cyber is leading us down that path to a large extent. You had a very interesting slide that had three interlocking circles, uh, which said crime targets victims for financial gain, espionage aims to discover state secrets, and war aims to alter the state policy and behaviour. Apart from the area where those circles overlap and interlock, which is a whole area for discussion, I'd like to suggest that one of the problems, that, one of the dilemmas that development of ethics has is the blurring, significant blurring of those definitions. For example, crime targets victims for financial gain. What about cyber vandalism? Espionage aims to discover state secrets, commercial and industrial espionage, and war aims to alter state policy and behaviour the blurring of the state concept that we're increasingly getting in the 21st century with non-state actors, for example, the global war on terror. Right. I'd be interested in your comments about how ethics copes with this increased blurring from where our ethics have come from in the past. The distinctions that you've uh, mentioned are all valid, and in some of my other work, I'm a little more careful than I was tonight to make sure that those, you know, that instead of three circles, there may be six or seven. Uh, and in fact, the whole issue that is troubling about cyber that I think, again, reinforces your concern is that the distinction between espionage, covert action, low-level ongoing conflict, and genuine acts of war between states is blurred, not to mention that the people pursuing and prosecuting the policy and setting the strategic goals are from the intelligence community, not the war-fighting community even though some wear uniforms. Uh, they're still intelligence folks. And, and the ethos or the ethical views of people in intelligence gathering are, to put it mildly, somewhat different than those of, of conventional war fighters. It's an issue, really, of, of what uh, the sponsoring organization focuses on, questions of professional ethics and the extent to which they overlap and hold things in common, and the extent to which different communities of practitioners have unique and special ethical norms or goals or values that they uphold. What are those of the intelligence community vis-a-vis -vis criminals that don't have any, presumably, and, uh, and war fighters? Um, and when espionage is carried out by commercial agents for commercial gain, if, the, if, the, if, if cyber warriors in China are stealing not state secrets but industrial secrets for economic, not political gain, again, um, Lines are blurred, and uh, I would argue that that, in particular, would be a, a violation of the professional code of the warrior, uh, that uh, the, the warrior's honor does not include stealing other people's you know, economic property. Uh, you, you act in the interest of the state, not the state's economy. But that's how one sorts this out. First, you have to have the distinctions clear, and then you have to see what community you're dealing with and what the um, the, the norms and guidelines of, of, of that profession or that practice are to be able to apply them. So it's less a problem for ethics than figuring out what, you know, what, it, what, what is the animal we're analyzing uh, and what rules and, and principles apply to it. Uh, that's not to suggest that this is all just relative to a community. There are some general standards there that I tried to tease out uh, that would apply to any professional community, any practice, such as not targeting or killing or aiming or intending to harm those who have done absolutely nothing to deserve being harmed or targeted or killed. Um, 
That applies in medicine, law, war, uh, you know, in a lot of areas. Um, so it is true, as, as you suggest, that the analysis here is still not complete enough, that we have gradations of activities that need to be sorted out, and the particular moral conundrums associated with each more carefully analyzed. Yeah, I'll just try one quick comment, though, with regards to the, the rules of the road, as you might have found out when you drove out of the airport of Canberra. Uh, the rules aren't exactly consistent across no. nation states. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we forgot to look left rather than right, or right rather than left, depending on where we were going. Um, and I, I did think of that. I thought that this is a, a nice illustration of the fact that it isn't necessary that everybody has to adopt identical conventions so much as they have to adopt agree upon conventions within a, a community of practice. So in Australia and the UK, both islands, um, uh, you, can, you feel free to, uh, uh, to thumb your nose at the conventions that are, are practiced on more landlocked continents uh, over which you know, some consistency has to be maintained. Uh, that said, the practices are followed consistently within each bounded community. Uh, and they know what the rules are, and they do it, and it works to their advantage. So um, I think rather than, you know, it, it's a humorous aside, but it also is an illustration of the point at issue. I just wanted to put a little pressure on this idea that anonymity is not a right thing. Uh, it seems to me that we do have at least some claim to anonymity anonymity, this is going to be a problem, uh, in some cases. So to give you a one-off case, my father, when arriving at a restaurant and asked to give a name for a table, inevitably gives the name Pliskin, in part, as in Snake Pliskin, <laughs> uh, in part to embarrass my mother and also in part because he doesn't think it's any of the hostess's damn business what his name is. Um, OK, well, it doesn't seem that we have that kind of claim on the state. Perhaps. So if a police officer were to walk up to me right now and demand my identification, it would seem that I would have no such right to refuse to identify myself. But in those cases, I can demand that this individual identify himself, both his name, uh, in the US at least, his badge number, which agency he's working for. And I may even ask, why do you need this information? Now, depending on the case, he may give me a more or less detailed answer. But I am still entitled to ask for this. Mm -hmm. And it seems that one of the issues with covert surveillance is that we have no way of doing this. And I was just wondering what your comment would be on that. Uh, we have no analogous way in the cyber realm of demanding the identity of those who are uh, undertaking surveillance of our activities, like we do when we watch a policeman you know, sitting in his car uh, keeping an eye on us on the beat or something. Um, is there some way in which that right to know that we're being put under suspicion or at least under surveillance could be exercised? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I haven't the technical competence to know if there's some way of, right, right now what gives me pause is what's being done is not lo exactly like the policeman surveying me and I noticing him. Uh, instead, an enormous volume of data is being examined by a complex set of mathematical algorithms to look for patterns that, once determined, get kicked upstairs two or three levels until somebody they come to some person's attention. Would there be, at that point, a right when um, the think of a case uh, the the constant email traffic between a group of people in San Diego, California, and uh, Yemen regarding financial transactions gets tagged, flagged, and kicked upstairs so that some human being is scratching their head saying, what the hell's going on here? For those people, or any of them, to say, now wait a minute, what right do you have to be keeping an eye on my email? Um, Right now, the only protection we have is that presumably they don't, they don't have that right. What they have a right to is that the emails can't be examined without taking the matter to a court and getting a warrant, um, a court which we've come as a result of Snowden's revelations to have some concern about the objectivity or impartiality of. Uh, I think we could do a better job with that. 
So there are a lot of tweaks in the system, I think, that could be made in good faith to protect uh, citizens' rights here and the rights of, of citizens of all countries. Um, whether they'd be one-to-one -one with the kind of system you described uh, on the street corner you know, up with the policeman, I don't know. Whether it would be advisable even to go that far, I'm not sure. The warrant is the thing I'd want to see, uh, and the oversight. Uh, the adversarial review, occasionally a judge who said no, you know, <laughs> there's not enough here to go on. Uh, in that case, there was, they did, they caught some guys who were funding Al-Qaeda in, in Yemen. But, um, you know, what about somebody who had a girlfriend there, you know, <laughs> and would get ready to get married and bring her over to the States or over to Australia or whatever. So, yeah. One of the other categories that Thomas Reed referred to in his article was that of subversion. So the activities of groups like Anonymous, for example. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, back in the day, that would be the, the sort of dialer demo. Uh, people, you know, at university campuses sort of just, you know, protesting whatever happened to be fashionable at the time. I think there's, that's still quite true, but their, the, their capacity to... Um, uh, cause harm against the organisation against which they're protesting has obviously improved with sort of the internet and right. that. I guess I wanted your views on um, how do we distinguish that kind of activity against legitimate forms of internet protest and the ethics of the security community of all the police um, encountering that. We have just sort of ceded the discussion of the territory to the hacktivists and the vandals and the vigilantes instead of wondering whether there were acceptable and preferable versus unacceptable forms of, of demonstration of uh, uh, difference of opinion and political protest and so forth. In the case of subversion in the, the good old days of the Vietnam War, say, we would distinguish between the right of peaceable assembly with signs and bullhorns and what have you, and people throwing cans of paint and feces and whatever, you know, to, to deface public property and uh, insult and uh, uh, assault citizens and generally create a, a nuisance um, with varying degrees of success. I mean, the protests in Chicago in 1968, protesters did some of those awful, nasty things, and the police overreacted. Uh, we didn't have a good sense of how to handle that at that time. I think police, by and large, uh, we have some uh, educators and uh, leaders in the um, um, uh, domestic uh, um, security field who would probably say we had a lot of lessons to learn from there. We do, a, we do a lot better now than we did in distinguishing the types of acceptable and unacceptable activity that we'll try and put a, a stop to and what we'll do, what kind of force the police might use. All that has to be worked out here. It's, it's all sort of, again, to go back to our anonymity and uh, um, lack of attribution, because there is no accountability. Um, we've essentially, at present, let the, the terms of discourse be set by the anarchists uh, and the vigilantes who don't distinguish. They, they think uh, defacing an internet site or even shutting down a hospital is just the same kind of protest as putting up a, a blog of their own or substituting a humorous cartoon for um, the president of the United States face on you know, something like that that's, that's kind of harmless and in good fun. They don't make those distinctions. They do all of those things equivalently, and there's no one to stop them. We don't even know who they are. Uh, I think it took, in the case of real protests, some reflection upon those who engaged in, in political dissonance in democratic and rights-respecting states to learn something about decorum uh, and appropriate conduct. Um, that wasn't on anybody's mind in 1968, I can assure you. Uh, and I think people are just somewhat better about that now. Uh, and those who aren't, those who still deface with paint cans and whatever else, are subject to arrest for def uh, defamation of property and whatever the you know, legal regime might be. So I think, again, it's one of those areas we can work it out if only we attend to it. We've just let it all go. Uh, 
either because we feel like it doesn't matter, it's not important, or because we feel helpless or overwhelmed. And I think none of those are the appropriate response. Thank you all for your attendance and participation. And I'm sure you'd like to thank uh, Professor Lucas once again for a very, very stimulating talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.